Well, um, thank you for inviting me back. This is the second time I'm here um, to give a talk. So hopefully the first one wasn't that bad. Um, I know you are, oh, wait, this is my. Can you stand more towards the center? Sure. So I know you are eating lunch, and the last thing you want to do is to take a quiz. <laughs> but you know, after all, I'm a teacher. Um, so I like to give exams and um, have pop quizzes. But you don't see any um, papers on your tables, do you? So this is going to be a mental quiz. So what I want you to do, you can continue eating, but I want you to mentally answer these questions. So these are questions on dietary supplements. I guess you came to this talk because you're interested in learning about dietary supplements, correct? Am I correct on that? Okay. So this is the first question. Do you take them? Okay. Do you need them? <laughs> Good answer. I don't know. Good answer. I don't know. Well, that's, that, this is going to be really fast. I think I'll be done with this presentation in 15 minutes. Um, do you know if they are safe? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. We'll get to that. And do you know if they are effective? Okay. Very good. So, but again, this is a mental quiz. I want you to remember these questions because we are going to go back to them. So, my final question in this quiz is this. Do you ask yourself these questions when you purchase dietary supplements? How many of you, when you are in any vitamin store, ask yourself these questions? Are they safe? Do I need them? Okay. All right. Well, then maybe I should just go back to my office. <laughs> So, more than 50% of the U.S. population takes dietary supplements. So, I don't know how many people we have in this room, but more than 50% of you are taking dietary supplements. And just in 2010, those people who are taking dietary supplements, some of you included, spent about $28 billion. $28 billion dollars in 2010 on dietary supplements. So in this presentation, my, my goal is not to uh, really give you a lecture on which dietary supplements you need to take. So I'm sorry if you came for that. Sorry about that. You're not going to get a list of these are the dietary supplements you need to take. But I'm going to create more questions in your minds so that when you go to purchase these dietary supplements, you keep asking yourself these questions and you keep wondering. So let's go back to these questions. The first time was if you take them and if you need them. So some of you said, yes, you take them. And I'm going to raise my hand too because, believe it or not, I still sometimes resort to uh, dietary supplements. But the question is, do we need them? Right? Do we need them? And the quick answer to this question is, for the most part, we don't need them. Unless you're very old, or you're pregnant, or you have a blood test that shows a deficiency in a vitamin or a mineral or something, you really don't need them. And it's really amazing that in spite of this fact, in 2010, we spent $28 billion in this country on dietary supplements, even if we don't really know if we need them. Um, the classic example as far as need is vitamin C, right? We've been using vitamin C forever, 75 years now. And we have data, research on vitamin C. And we still don't have a conclusion on how much benefit people who take vitamin C get from vitamin C. I'm not, not anti-vitamin C. Again, I want to go back to the point that do you need them? And I can quote many other supplements and minerals that we take, and most likely we don't need them. Another important question is, oops, oops, okay. Oh, this was not supposed to look like this. I, I thought I was uh, getting much better at the AV. So I'm glad I don't have any students here because they would start making fun of me. But um, yeah, this was supposed to be a very cool animated slide, but it's not. Do you know if they are safe? 
Do you know if they are safe? So this is something else that we don't know. So how many of you, well obviously you take them, right? You go to a vitamin store and you buy supplements. So how many of you is 100% sure that the supplement that you're consuming in, from those bottles, from any store, and I'm not gonna mention names here, is completely safe? We don't know. So the answer again to this question is we don't know. A very interesting study was published not too long ago. We looked at 2,000, they looked at, the researchers in this study looked at 2,000 dietary supplements that are being promoted from 300 manufacturers. And 25% of them have high concentrations of heavy metals and they were adulterated. So when do we find out that these supplements are not safe for us? When do we find out? If you get sick, if you get sick only when they harm us. Only when they harm us. And I'd like to share an example uh, for, with you here. So how many of you, and I'm sure you know the answer to this question, as, so I'm not going to ask it, but the question was how many of you think that FDA Food and Drug Administration controls vitamin industry or supplement industry. Just like pharmaceuticals, right? So if you go to your physician and get a prescription, the chances are, I mean not the chances, that pharmaceutical, that drug is approved by FDA. We don't have such a regulation for dietary supplements in this country. And when it comes to FDA approval, there is no such a thing when it comes to dietary supplements. FDA is not required to approve any of these dietary supplements. And mistakes have happened. And again, the only time that we found out that this supplement was, hot, was not safe is when it started um, hurting us. So what do you see on this slide? Two beautiful flowers, right? You see plantain and you see foxglove. So what happened a few years ago is that some harvesters mixed these two plants up. They mistook foxglove for plantain. And I'm looking at these flowers. Do they look the same? Not really. Foxglove has high concentrations of digitalis, which is a heart medication. And this plant is used as a laxative. What? Laxative. So when these two were mixed up, people who were thinking they were taking plantain for constipation started having heart attacks. This was on the market for one year before FDA got involved and before people started realizing that, oh, there was a mistake. And of course it was removed from the market. And this is just one example of how, of how unsafe some of these dietary supplements could be. So next time when, we, when I ask the question of safety, I guess we are going to be a little bit more cognizant because again, 25% of what we have on the market may be adulterated and may be contaminated with something else. So now the final question is this. Do you know if they are effective? Do you know if they are effective? Okay, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm actually going forward, but, oh, why, I'm going forward and we should have workshops for faculty on how to use slides. Okay, so these are some claims. Okay, I figured it out. I was doing the opposite of what I'm supposed to do. Claims, supports the immune system. How many of us I'm raising my hand as the first <laughs> victim here. How many of us take supplements to support our immune system? Okay, oops. How many makes, how many take supplements to make the fat disappear? For weight loss, for burning fat, all those you know, wonderful supplements out there on the market. How many of us, and this is a common question that I answer to my students, 
take supplements to build muscle mass and strength. Okay, so now the question is this, going back to FDA, do you think any of those claims that are made by supplements are approved by FDA? I said no, but I don't know why. Okay, now I'm doing it right. So I don't know what is happening. Okay, John, I have no idea. This time I'm doing it right. <laughs> I think it's side to side. Yeah, that's always going to be forward. And you're doing up and down. I was. Do side to side. Okay, because that's what it is in my classroom. <laughs> and how many of us take supplement to improve our memory? I used to be a big uh, fan of uh, ginkgo for that. So here is the problem, and I forgot to bring my magnifier. <laughs> Can you read this? No, I have a big magnifier, so when I go to vitamin stores, I take my big magnifier. So if I had my ma magnifier, this is what you would read here. This statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. But we don't pay attention to this, right? Because we, you know, we pretty much believe uh, what we read on the label. So what should we do? So what should we do? No, I'm not going to tell you, especially with this thing that is not. Going back to those questions, the first question is, do I need them? So maybe a good step would be next time you go for your annual checkup to see your primary care provider, get a blood test, and now we have all these fancy tests to measure any mineral and any vitamin deficiency that you can imagine. I was talking to my mother about this test because my mom take, does take supplements. And then she said, oh no, these tests are very expensive. My insurance doesn't cover it. And then I said, that's very interesting. You're not going to pay for a vitamin D test. That's going to maybe add another $25 to your lab test. But you are paying almost $50 a month for the supplement because she gets the high quality one. It has to be really high quality but we don't know if she needs it. So that's the first question. The second question is manufacturer safety. So in my mind, if I were going to take a supplement, which I am, so I'm going to, be, to uh, make a little confession here, I want to make sure that that manufacturer is following good manufacturing practices. I want to make sure that that factory, that site, where they manufacture these products is approved by a reputable institution such as USP. So you can go on USP website and see a list of companies that they have visited, approved, and continuously approved. So that's one way to know that at least this is high quality. Another, um, there are some other consumer um, uh, websites um, I, I, I don't want to advertise any of them, but there are some out there that you can go to and see if this supplement was recalled or <laughs> got in trouble with FDA because their product was adulterated or contaminated. So there are ways to check. And then, of course, the safety, right? And then finally, when it comes to efficacy, you have to read the science behind these supplements, again, with a big magnifier. Um, I just love a statement that my son made the other day because he wants to take supplements to build muscles. And then I said, what is the science behind it? Oh, let me take you to the website. So he's taking me to the website of the company <laughs> that manufactures that supplement, showing me scientific data. And yeah, I mean, I saw the science. But who is supporting that science? Do you see a conflict of interest here? Yeah, I, I saw that too. So you have to be very careful when you read science. I mean, I'm becoming so careful that even if that science was published in a reputable journal, I want to find out who sponsored that study. If that supplement is manufactured by company XYZ, and company XYZ provided a grant to this university to do the study, I am going to step back and question that. 
So I'm sorry, I'm not here to give anybody any um, good news, but <laughs> so, so far, so far the talk has been quite depressing, I know, but it gets better, I promise. So again, questions, needs, manufacturer, safety, efficacy, and science. So these are the questions that you need to ask yourself. And the magnifier, I have this big magnifier, I forgot to bring it today. So but we go back to the same questions, what should we do? What should we do? So now, so some of you saw the title of this presentation is my grandmother never took dietary supplements, right? And you thought maybe my grandmother is coming with me to give this talk, <laughs> but she, she passed away. I try to find, for this presentation, I, I try to find somebody who never took dietary supplements. And I couldn't use myself because I unfortunately every now and then I take them. So the only person that came to my mind was my grandmother. My grandmother never took dietary supplements. She, um, I remember when she was 70 years old, we took her for a complete checkup. And the doctor, after the blood test work, came back, looked at the blood test and told her, your, your values look like a 20 year old values. She was so healthy at that age. And then my grandmother looked at the doctor and said, wait a minute, if the numbers look like a 20-year-old value, how come I have all these wrinkles and white hair? <laughs> and the doctor said, ma'am, you're seven years old. <laughs> so, that's, so let's not go there. My grandmother passed away when she was 88. So she passed away when she was 88. And in her country, the average life, lifespan at the time was 63. So I like to say that she lived a pretty good life. So I want to talk to you from this point on about my grandmother. My grandmother was active because I'm hoping that I can convince you at the end of this presentation by some lifestyle changes, we don't have to reach out for things that we don't know whether they're safe, effective, and we don't want to waste our money, right? So hopefully we can achieve that. So my grandmother was very active. I remember that she was constantly moving. She did not have a membership to any gyms. She never lifted any weights. She was very active. I remember one day she asked me to um, accompany her to a friend's house for tea. And she said, let's just walk. I said, okay, let's walk. So we started walking, and after 30 minutes of walking, I said, when are we going to get there? She said, a few more minutes. We walked 60 more minutes. So we got to this friend's house, we had the tea, and we walked back another 90 minutes. Um, and I'm sure she knew I had a car, and I could <laughs> you know, drive my car, but she wanted to walk. So she was constantly moving, and she was walking, and very active. She didn't know the science behind exercise. So this slide, I can give a three hour lecture on the impact of exercise, the benefits of exercise. But she didn't know anything that you see on this slide. She didn't know that exercise can prevent diabetes. She didn't know exercise can improve cognition. Actually, the dementia and cognition study was done by one of our own faculty members at UCI. I, I'm sure some of you have heard Dr. Cotman talking about the benefits of exercise on delaying dementia, and I'm not going to talk about Alzheimer uh, because I don't recall the details of that study, but we know the benefits of exercise. And we are not talking about half an hour of cardio every day and two hours of weightlifting. We are just talking about walking, moderate walking. So these are the benefits of exercise, improving inflammation. Decreasing stress, um, depression. They have done studies when they had compared actually pharmaceuticals and walking. And walking and increasing our endorphin level a little bit was as effective as a pharmaceutical, as a drug that we reach so quickly the moment we have a little bit of depression. Because unfortunately, we are becoming, what? A very medication-oriented and a quick fixer culture. So according to my grandmother, next time that you feel a little bit sad and blue, just 
get out there and walk. Walk for half an hour. This is what I tell my students too. We have, you have no idea how much pressure our undergraduate students have on this campus. So I just tell them, go out and walk. Just walk on campus. Exercise can also prevent osteoporosis. Number of studies comparing calcium, calcium, vitamin D supplements. Let me tell you something. If you, you can take as much calcium as you want, but if you don't exercise, and in this case, you need to also do some weight-bearing exercises, you don't get as much benefit as you do with the combination, meaning that when you exercise and take calcium and vitamin D supplements. Lower blood pressure. Again, I can give a one hour lecture on that. So by moderate exercise, by walking, if you have borderline hypertension, you can remain <coughs> hypertension medication free for many years. So these are some benefits of exercise that my grandmother didn't know anything about. My grandmother also ate lots of fresh fruits, vegetables, and nuts. I remember once I complained to her about a headache. I told her that I have a pretty bad headache. She reached into her pockets and she offered me some almonds. And, and I, I remember I was a first year graduate student at pharmacy school and I'm thinking, okay, almonds and headache, okay, fine. I, I like almonds, so I ate them. The other day I was complaining about pain. I had... Uh, done, a, not a marathon run, but a run, and I was aching everywhere. And I said, I really have like, you know, muscle pain. She offered walnuts to me for that. <laughs> so my grandmother didn't know the science behind fruits, vegetables, and nuts, and the health benefit of these functional foods. She didn't know anything about functional foods. If you review the scientific literature, the functional food science is really, really booming. It's amazing how nature is offering us natural drugs, and in my mind, if we take them in moderation with not m much toxicity, of course, if you go to the farmer's market this Saturday and buy two bags of those big oranges and eat them all, I'm sure you're going to have experienced some sort of toxicity, but uh, on average, we don't. So my grandmother was really big on fresh fruits and vegetables, and she didn't know anything that you see on this, on this slide. She didn't know that consumption of fruits, vegetables, and nuts can decrease oxidative stress. So how many of you have never heard this term, oxidative stress? So we are constantly producing reactive oxygen species. We are sitting here, actually the mere fact of eating that lunch created a very high oxidative stress right now in your bodies. We go out there, we are constantly faced with radiation, pollution, and you name it. So we are walking bodies high in oxidative stress. So we have two options, right? We can take those dietary supplements, and usually we overdose ourselves. I used to do that. I used to think that if I take 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C, I'm going to kill all the reactive oxygen species in my body. But you know what? That much supplement, when it comes to antioxidants, create actually a pro-oxidant state in my body. So the safest way to deal with the oxidative stress is to reach for those fruits, vegetables, and nuts, because you are going to have the right dose. Believe me, you are not going to overdose yourself with oranges and kiwis and you know, other fruits. Fruits, vegetables, and nuts also improve heart, heart function. They delay cancer, they can lower blood pressure, they can improve glucose levels. We have a number of studies on the impact of various nuts on the good cholesterol. We have studies suggesting that if you eat this much almonds per day, you can, you can increase your HDL, which is the good cholesterol. So maybe my grandmother, when she gave me almond for headache, she thought I was suffering from low levels of HDL. Um, I'm sure she didn't. So fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And then finally, the last thing that I want to talk about uh, my grandmother is her positive attitude and her, her very strong faith. 
This picture was taken right before a surgery. So here we are all worried about this. It was a pretty bad um, surgery, so we were all worried about that. And here she is giggling with my grandfather, telling him that if she passed away and died under the surgery, he cannot marry a woman who is more beautiful than her. <laughs> she said, you can marry after if I'm gone, but nobody more beautiful than me. She also had, she always saw the glass completely full. I remember we used to go to her with complaints about everything because, of course, we all like to complain. And she would listen, so oh, yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, she would listen, but then she would say, but this is really not the end of the world, is it? And I would say, what do you mean? I just got a C in my class. And this. She said, no, this is not really the end of the world. And she also had a very strong faith system. I remember when I was studying for my boards, um, I called her and I said, I'm so worried because I haven't really studied much and I'm not a good test taker. I mean, give me a multiple choice um, exam. The chances are even if I'm ready, I'm, not, I'm going to fail. I'm not a good exam taker. So I said, okay, this is my situation and I have to pass these boards to get my license. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. I am doing some heavy duty prayers for you. <laughs> okay, I'm thinking, okay, great, <laughs> this is great. So the passing rate for my board, this is 1994, was 75%. I had, I had to get 75% to pass my board. And guess what? I got 75%. <laughs> so to date, I wonder if those heavy duty prayers have anything to do with me passing those boards because honestly, there were questions on that exam that I couldn't even understand, let alone going to the multiple choice, choices and answer it. So, Positive attitude and faith can also make you live a pretty good life and a long life. But then there's science behind that, right? So it's not, I mean, I used to say that, oh, these are like all touchy-feely, because I'm a basic scientist. I need to see things in my lab. I need to see things under the microscope. I need to measure markers in the blood. And now I work with fruit flies, so I have to see changes in my fruit flies to believe in a change. But now, and I, if you had told me 10 years ago that optimism can help you live longer, I would give you a big smile. So, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. But now we have science. Now we have the science to prove that faith and optimism <coughs> increases lifespan, it delays diseases, it can prevent depression. I mean, how many optimists do you know who are depressed. <laughs> no, seriously, I was thinking about it because when I, when I read this study, I was thinking, but this is who did this study? Why did we spend time and money to do this study? I have never seen somebody who is very positive and very optimistic depressed. Anxiety. How many of us reach for Xanax or Valium the moment that we feel a little bit anxious? How many of us go to the physician's office, right, our physician's clinic, and we say that, you know, I can't sleep, I wake up in the middle of the night, I have anxiety, and what do you get? You get a prescription for Xanax, or you get a prescription for another pharmaceutical. And what I think the physician should do is to give you a piece of paper with a happy face on it, and say, just go and be happy. <laughs> and of course, it's much, you know, easier said than done. Lower blood pressure, I had no idea. I had no idea that optimism and having a positive attitude can even lower blood pressure. But we have data suggesting that. And my research is on anti-aging and lifespan extension. And faith and optimism can increase lifespan. I just don't know how I can teach my fruit flies to be more optimistic <laughs> and have faith and measure their lifespan. I think it's going to be pretty hard doing that in, in animal you know, models. But I'm sure in humans it's been done. So I would like to end this talk with more questions for you. So we pretty much have two choices, right? We can either continue taking the dietary supplements and I'm not standing here telling you that I don't take any dietary supplements. But the question is, 
do we really need them? And do we ask ourselves those questions? Are they safe? Do I need them? And are they effective? So I guess the take home message is next time you're in a store purchasing your supplements, ask yourself those questions. And if we choose not to, then there are other ways that we can improve our health. And my grandmother for me is the best example because I interacted with her very closely and at the time I didn't know anything about the scientific data. I didn't know anything about the science of exercise, food, optimism, and all that. But now I do. So we all have choices. I mean, the fact that we are all here eating this healthy lunch and listening to me lecturing on don't take any dietary supplements is, the, is actually a positive sign that we do worry about our health and we want to um, improve it. And I would like to end being... Uh, in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences on campus, I would like to end by saying that for the most part, we can stay away from medications. By healthy choices, by life, lifestyle changes, we can stay away from medications. And by healthy choices, we can also stay away from dietary supplements. But there is a time that we have no choice, right? So somebody told me that my... Um, a friend of mine was asking me about an infection that her son had. And um, she said the doctor gave him very high concentrations of retin-A and benzoyl peroxide for his acne. And I said, have you tried tea tree oil? She said, tea tree oil? I said, yeah. Because there was a very small study suggesting that 5% benzoyl peroxide is as effective as tea tree oil for you know, facial acne. So where do we get this information? Again, going back to the science and really reading the science very carefully. But before we reach for medications, I personally like to reach for natural remedies, and in this case, just a very simple example, tea tree oil. And then before even reaching to that point, looking for lifestyle changes. So I'm going to end here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Now we can talk about supplements. <laughs> do you want to do it on the mic or do you want to take on to you individually? It's a, no, we can. I can take, if you have any questions, I can take them. So everybody hears it. Yes? Have you heard anything about something called Coke? Coenzyme Q10. Mm -hmm. Yes, Coke Q10. Yes. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. It's supposed to be very new. Yeah. So my quick answer to your question, if, it's, if, your, if your question is about efficacy, is that yes, it works. So we do have studies, for instance, suggesting that if you are on high doses of a cholesterol-lowering drug, such as statins, and you are damaging your muscles, your, you know, you name it, if you take CoQ10, you can somehow delay or slow down the damage. And CoQ10 works on the mitochondria, right? So the main mechanism of action of CoQ10 is on the mitochondria. And mitochondria are these little factories in our cells. Mitochondria produce energy in our bodies. They produce the ATP. So CoQ10 has been shown through actually studies that have been funded by NIH. So these are not studies sponsored by a you know, uh, dietary supplement company, that it works. Now the question is quality. So in my mind, if you go to a store and buy 100 CoQ10 for $15, the chances are you're not really getting a good CoQ10. So I can't tell you which company makes the best CoQ10, but if you can find high quality CoQ10, there are studies suggesting that it's good for heart failure, it can delay it, it can you know, improve your muscle um, function, and it works on the mitochondria. That's, the, that's actually not even a million dollar, that's a billion dollar <laughs> question. Try them all. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> yes. So you're suggesting that quality is related to price, is that correct? No, I said that if you are finding a product 
100 CoQ10 tablets for $15, the chances are the quality is, is not so great. What I recommend when it comes to dietary supplements is to find pharmaceutical grade, meaning that that product has already been through some testing. And the chances are, if it's a pharmaceutical grade product, it's not going to be very cheap. It's not, and then if you, um, I mean, we don't have time to get into um, all the details, but there are many food products out there that are high in uh, many of these vitamins and supplements. CoQ10 is not, actually, is not one of them, but um, so we can consume them, consume these products, these functional foods. Well, your questions obviously are terrific. That's exactly what you have to do. But do you think most people are able on their own find the answers to these questions? This is an excellent question. So the question is, these are great questions, but do I think most people on their own are able to find answers to these questions? And the answer to your question is probably not. But I think it's better to have these questions than not having them. And, and we are becoming a very savvy um, consumer society. So we can go online, we can find claims, I mean, a friend of mine was looking for a company that makes, I mean, this is a very long story. It's, it's, some, it, it's a product that deals with cyanide toxicity. And she was ready to purchase these products. And I said, go and check the FDA.gov website. And sure enough, FDA has been after this company trying to uh, stop their production because their, their products were um, um, not working. So we can find some of this information, but you're absolutely right. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. And I think that's why this industry is doing so well, because we don't know anything. And my question is, with this economic crisis and low budgets everywhere, why are we spending $28 billion on things that we don't even know if they work or they don't work? Yes. No, she passed away. Yes. 88. What about fish oil? Fish oil. That's another good question. So um, fish oil works. So fish oil is one of the few supplements that um, we do have studies suggesting that if you have mild arthritis, it may work. And I use the word may. I had a knee in injury myself, and no matter what I did, physical therapy, everything, it, it, I wasn't improving. And it's not a, an injury that requires surgery, which makes it very difficult to deal with. So I, I took high dose fish oil, pharmaceutical grade fish oil, and it didn't really help me. And then when I was talking to a friend who suggested that, she said it helped me. So my suggestion is take it, find a high quality one, take it for a month or two, and see if it works. There are some data also suggesting fish, fish oil may prevent memory loss. And um, I think that data is not, I don't want to say it's not conclusive, because it is really moving more towards being positive than being a question mark. So if you can find high quality fish oil, that would work. Now, are pharmaceutical grade supplements marked on the bottle as being pharmaceutical grade? Yes, and there is a prescription um, quality fish oil on the market from your doctor's office. So you ask for the oh, prescription. You have to have a yeah. Um, this, is, this has nothing to do with this lecture, but this is, a very, um, this is an issue that is very close to my heart. Another problem with fish oil is the overfishing. So we are depleting our oceans of this fish and everything that moves pretty much in the oceans for selfish reasons. So I used to say that the best fish oil product, which is actually a very good quality one, they sell it at Mother's Market. I used to talk about it, but now I step back because I looked at where they do their fishing and how they are doing it. And now I'm like, oh my God, I, am, I had no idea. So, so but again, this is a, this is a personal uh, thing. It has nothing to do with dietary supplements. Do you have uh, any, not suggestions, but protein shakes and things like that? Do you do any, do you have a so the question is on uh, protein shakes, and this is the question I get from my students and uh, my brother and my son. 
Um, I don't really have any opinion on that, but there are some good ones on the market. And again, you need to make sure that the company doesn't have any complaint because FDA. If you go on FDA.gov, they are, they are required to list them. So you want to make sure that the manufacturer doesn't have any injunctions, for instance. They haven't questioned their quality. Um, and what I tell my son is that if you want to increase your protein, just, just go to farmer's market, buy organic eggs, and eat the egg white. <laughs> and that's, that's your protein. I think some people do protein shakes because they have a lot of vitamins and things in there. Yeah, so yeah and if you need them. And th that's a very good point. And if you need them, so the, so the question is, some people take these shakes because they also have you know, vitamins and minerals. And if you need them, why not? It's not a bad idea. Yes? I was just wondering, I was reading about how um, some of the natural like, you know, herbs and stuff would help filtrate the body of whatever antioxidants, such as cilantro. Do you know, or can you tell me something about that? I'm just kind of curious. Like making a shake. A, a juice oh yeah, this green, yeah. So the green, um, <laughs> what is it called? Green juice industry is booming, mm -hmm. yes. Um, if you need it. I mean, I just wondered if you'd heard anything about it. Cause, I mean, I know the supplements are really great too, but in your body, there's some things that we need to do also. There's, there's yes. acidities that we can eliminate through. through no, I, I definitely agree with you. And as we age, the pH of our body, the the good bacteria, our normal flora, everything changes, our enzymes changes. I mean, I, I used to say that, oh, there is no food allergy. I used to tell people, this is just, you know, made up stuff. No, I'm aging and I am experiencing some food allergies now. Um, so, so the quick answer to your question is, go to farmer's market, buy those fruits and vegetables and make that shake at home yourself. This way you're not worried about, am I overdosing myself? What is the right dose for me? Concerning the conclusion that I'm going to draw from your lecture, I'll tell me if you agree with this. Okay. And that is, unless your doctor recommends it, it's better not to take supplements on your own than um, not take them at all. So the, um, so the question is, this is the conclusion, what was the conclusion of my talk? And what is your name? Stan. Stan. Stan's conclusion from my talk is that unless your doctor recommends supplements based on your blood test, don't take it. Yes, in an ideal world, that's exactly what I recommend. Unless you need them, don't take them. Because we honestly don't have any data, any scientific data to suggest more is better. Or any is better, or any is better. I think that's it. Oh, yes, last question. <laughs> so the question is uh, using probiotics for digestive uh, issues. Um, and I wish you had not asked this question, because I take probiotics. And I have, I'm learning that, again, as I'm aging, I need them. So there are, the data on probiotics is actually not that bad. And NIH is now funding studies looking at the impact of probiotics on immune system and the digestive um, issues. Um, so my advice to you is take them, but again, go for a high quality one. And most high quality probiotics should be refrigerated. You can buy a probiotics that you carry in your purse under the sun and an 80 degree <laughs> temperature. So buy a good one and use it for a month to see if it works. And if it works, continue taking them. Um, what, what about how much? Because when I look on the shelf, you can get anywhere from 1 billion organisms. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, from what I understand, and I have talked to my friends who are um, homeopaths and naturopaths, there are apparently not, no toxicities associated with probiotics. So I would say start with 30 billion. And yeah, that's, that's the, what is it, that's the critical one, 10 to 30, or start with the low dose, I'm sorry, 30 is too high, 10, and then go up. And if, if they work for you, they work for you. But, but if you find a good quality one, from what I know, and again, I always have to say, as of right now, because tomorrow a study could be published that probiotics are really bad for you. 
So as of right now, October 26, 2012, <laughs> probiotics seem to be safe. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll talk to you.